Looks like we're live. Good evening and welcome to General Council for March 26. Um, before we get started, can we take a moment of silence to honor the community members we have recently lost? Can we have a moment? Thank you. So before we get into the agenda, um, we have um, a special um, request. It's uh, presenting plaque to retirees and recognizing their years of service with Six Nations of the Grand River. So the first one we have, but she is unable to attend, is Deborah Martin, uh, Social Services, Child Care Services for Early Childhood Worker. Uh, today, we honor Deborah Martin for her exceptional career in retirement, her punctuality, organization, and teamwork have been outstanding with passion, reliability, and professionalism. She's made the lasting impact and best wishes to Deborah for a joyful retirement. And these all were from the supervisors we reached out to. So Deborah would be getting um, her plaque for 26 years. <laughs> so the next one we have is Roseanne Bonne Bonneviser. She had 14 years with Social Services Child Care Service as Secretary Clerk. Roseanne embarks on her retirement journey. We reflect on her impactful career as a uh, paramedic. She cherished serving children and now looks forward to Precious moments with her grandchildren, Roseanne credits Yvette Martin for her guidance and encourages newcomers to ask questions and, pre and to prove her uh, Wishing you endless joy and relaxation, Roseanne. So this one here for uh, 14 years. Uh, the next one we have is Wendy Laform, 36 years, social services, uh, child care services, early childhood worker. Uh, Wendy LaForm is viewed as one of the most caring, compassionate, honest, empathetic, heartwarming human being on Mother Earth. Wendy has an incredible work ethic, integrity, professional, responsible, reliable team player and dedication. We will miss Wendy's humor and her teachings and the way she was with the staff and the children. So enjoy your retirement. Uh, very, uh, you're very much. It was very much deserved. So this is Wendy's for 36 years. So the next one we have is Sherry Yake. She's unable to, but we have her family. Um, her daughter Natasha Slezak will be accepting uh, Sherry's um, plaque. So 19 years, health services, mental health clinical lead. Sherry Yake has been an outstanding asset to the mental health and addictions team. She was always willing to help staff and our community members. The entire mental health and addictions team will miss Sherry dearly. I will miss Sherry's caring nature and dedication to the Six Nations community. I wish Sherry all the best on her next adventures. And this is a quote from Sherry, I had an honor of growing both professionally and personally, and will always be grateful for the opportunities for my professional advancement and development that was provided by the Six Nations Health Services. <laughs> okay, 
So the last that we have is Ronald Bumberry, 23 years health services paramedic service as a paramedic. Today, we celebrate Ron Bumberry's remarkable career and retirement. His dedication, uh, reliability, and professionalism have made a lasting impact. Wishing you a fulfilling retirement, Ron. So before we give Ron his plaque, we have something to play. What is it, his last, how do you say? His last call. Just bear with us. We're just getting, sorry, the sound. Calling 24994. This is the last call for Six Nations paramedic Ron Bomberry. After 29 years of service, Ron is retiring. Uh, we having difficulties again. Hamilton calling 24994. This is the last call for Six Nations paramedic Ron Bomberry. After 29 years of service, Ron is retiring. Ron's career started off with his graduation in 1995, where after he was hired in Brantford part-time. He sat on the steering committee with Six Nations Council, Health Services, and the MLH, and aided in the establishment of Six Nations paramedic service in 2000. Ron was one of the original hires and has been a pillar of service ever since. Ron not only provided care for the Six Nations community, but is also is a very respected member of our community. Ron took extra pride in assisting with our new employees in orientation, along with his most recent partner, Terry, taking around new employees, providing history and knowledge on the intricacies of his community. Your years of service and dedication to your patients and coworkers will be forever remembered. Thank you for your service. Good afternoon. It was 24994. Roger, copy all that. And uh, thank you very much for having my back for the last 24 years uh, with Six Nations and another nine years for the city of Brantford. It's a wonderful career. All units 10-3. All units 10-3. Hamilton calling 24994.
Thank you so much. So again, for all the recipients, thank you for all your um, years of hard work and dedication. It is much appreciated and enjoy your retirement. So let's move on to the adoption of the agenda. Is there any additions or deletions? If not, can I have a mover? Moved by Melba, second by Carrie. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Seen none. carried. Hey, um, number five, delegations. We have Dan Sitzma, Sitzma, Sitzma regarding the Laura Mohawks. Um, you can come to the front. And when you speak, if you can just push the um, mic, it'll... Sure. Yeah. Oh, just turn on the mic, just push the button. There you go. Yeah, oh. you can stand or sit, it's up to you. There we go. You can sit if you would like. Okay. If not, it's just make it easier for you. Yep. Go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of myself, your Laura Mohawks Junior B Lacrosse Club, I just appreciate the time you're giving me to express and hope to try and find some support in any way we can, suggestions or whatever in addressing a possible name change of a, of our lacrosse team, which has been established since 1967, the Laura Mohawks Junior B Lacrosse Club. Uh, it's been approached by, namely, Center Wellington Recreation. Uh, what happened about five years ago, our minor lacrosse system, we're always called the Center Wellington Mohawks because we combined with Elora and Fergus, and they on the, for the sake of two or three people, they went behind everybody's back and they did it their own way before they put it to the press. They changed the name of Mohawks to, of the minor lacrosse system to Riverhawks because of, they said it was harmful. The Mohawk name was, was negative in more sense than one. Anyway, before it was too late, it was done. And me being part of the Laura Mohawks Junior B Lacrosse Club for some 15 years and with both the minor lacrosse as a referee for 19 years and with the senior lacrosse, I just want to address a couple of points that I'd like to state with you. Uh, the name Laura Mohawks has been around since 1967. The name Mohawks is both not derogatory or it's not discriminatory in any way, shape, or form. It's not negative. And the name is, it shows the name Mohawk. I did some research It respect, it's respect for the Mohawk tribe. As I said before, the Mohawk tribe is, has done nothing wrong. It's, they invented the game, part of the vendors of the game. Uh, 1967, the Laura Mohawks, when they played their first lacrosse game, they played it against Cornwall and they had named their team the Laura Mohawks. Out of respect for the Cornwall organization, they asked if it was any objection to using the name Mohawks. And their answer was not at all because the Mohawk tribe was part of the tribe that invented the game of lacrosse. They also, they got, they received permission going forward. And uh, to this day, the Mohawk tribe is, has been respected. Uh, some people today state that other sports teams, such as the Washington Redskins, were forced to change their name. The Laura Mohawks should not be forced to change their name. I wish to ask the question, why did the Washington Redskins change their name? The complaints were Redskins was offensive to the Native Americans. Now, since the name change has happened since 1920, since 2022, the Native American Guardians Association wants to see the name Commanders, which is the name of the football team now, 
returned to the old name as a way to honor the Native American heritage. As far as the process is concerned, I don't know how far they are along with this, but I just did some research again last week. In closing, to everybody here, as stated before, Mohawk name is not only not a slang name, it's not derogatory, and as far as I'm concerned, it's not offensive anyway. Uh, one other statement, I'm open to suggestions, but also hope to find some support in the form of a letter to the Center Wellington Recreation Director on our behalf. A um, couple other small points. The Recreation Director in Center Wellington played for two years for the Six Nations Chiefs, Major Lacrosse. He won a Man Cup with them. He established friendships with both his teammates and the Indian community. And I know for a fact that uh, I communicate with some of the people here in uh, Six Nations still on a regular basis, Cap Bomberry. Uh, they know a lot of the names up in Fergus in the Laura area. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, I would hope that I could find some letter and form some support in form of a letter to the Recreation Committee. Um, one other thing. There's uh, the junior B team, uh, the general manager, Scott Markle, and the junior A Arrows is run by Cody Jamison. Um, I tried to reach out to them, sending out an email and a phone call message. I didn't receive any response from them, but uh, I just hope since you're counsel, I just hope maybe if you're open to any suggestions in the next week or so, whether you have to meet again and then send me a letter, I would hopefully try to find some kind of support in keeping the Mohawk name respectable. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there any questions or comments or? Uh... Thank you, Dan. Is there any questions, comments for Dan? Mel Melba? Yeah. Uh, I've been uh, to your place, Fergus, many times. My late husband played lacrosse and uh, at that time, I didn't remember that you were called the Elora Mohawks, but I certainly was there many times. And I find that any name that uh, uh, describes our people, Mohawk, Yuga, others, it's not def not offensive at all. I think um, it uh, is not derogatory, as I mentioned earlier in a meeting, or negative. And I would hope that you would continue to recognize us and respect us as uh, as founders of this country. We are the First Nations of this country, and we welcome the settlers to come. And you have ancestors and yourself are one of them. So I appreciate your coming here today to tell us what happened in your community. And I would hope that uh, we could support the renaming of Mohawk in your lacrosse club. Yes, like the name Mohawk um, would, I like from this day forward to keep it the way it is. Yes. Now, and as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, any suggestions or whatever form of a letter or whatever directed to, I could email in the next week or so to Brooke or to Chief Sherry Lynn there, any, uh, forwarding addresses or whatever. I do have a couple here today, but uh, if it takes time to discuss amongst everybody whether what you would like to put in a letter, if a letter is gonna be put forward on, on part of the council. Um, other than that, we, had, we still communicate with people in, we've had many battles with Six Nations over the years and we might be different on the floor, but uh, <laughs> I remember winning a fifth and deciding game down here a number of years ago in Six Nations down at the ILA Arena in the last minute of the game. And uh, you ask any of the Bomberries and anybody, if they know any of the Landonis, Landonis are a famous lacrosse name in the Lauren Fergus area, and some of them still to this day communicate and are friends with. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, um Melba, can you just hit your mic? Yes. Elena? Thanks for coming in, Dan. I was wondering if you, you your lacrosse club provides any education about the history of 
the Mohawk Nation to its members? And if so, what is it? Uh, no, I, I don't. Uh, as far as it's concerned, this name change, not with the miners, is started by two or three people that were new to the executive and they basically their rationale was behind everybody that like the Washington Redskins had to change their name, the Whitby Warriors had to change their name and two or three people basically were trying to push against the people that were had lacrosse background in the past who have built the Mohawk tradition from ground zero like and have kept the Mohawk name in good standing. Yeah, and I think I'm talking more culturally. So you would agree that the game can be contentious and aggressive at times? I would agree that naturally with what's going on in today's society, that education, you're always learning more as far as, as, far as education wise, to educate the general public and to say a, a phrase before each game respecting indigenous community that it should be unfortunate the way their negative approach is to changing the name these days we could come back in a form of a proactive thing stating respecting the indigenous people and everything else before a game there as there is statements that we have had in the past where we the lower mohawks respect all indigenous people and the you know and the general mohawk name so my thing is is uh out of respect to everybody around it all these name changes have been brought about by about two or three people and there's a lot of lacrosse knowledgeable people who have been involved over the years in the fergus Laura lacrosse community who are negative against it, the name change. And if it does happen, I, I would rather have something put on Casey's desk, the recreation director, as I said, he played here for two years and was a part of, he had friends and still communicates with friends in the Six Nations area to prove to him that you council and the general people of Six Nations would support us, and that one might make could be a dead issue as far as the name change is concerned. That's all I want to know. Like, if we can push it under the carpet and keep the Mohawk name, that's what we would like to prove. One other point: we just finished renovating our lower arena, and part of the renovation we had to take all the banners and plaques down of lower Mohawks and everything else. And to this right now. They don't want to put the Mohawk banners up from winning championships or whatever because of what's going on in the world. Now, I think that's a little off, offbeat. You know, you've got to respect past achievements of not only mainly lacrosse people, but uh, like the minor hockey association isn't called the Mohawks or anything, but uh, the Mohawk tribe, it's another way of like, why would they want to? not put the banners back up from past recognition of accomplishments by various teams over the years. Follow up, Elena? Yeah, I appreciate your answer. And I respect everybody who is trying to grow the sport and and participates in, in its um, publicity. Um, I think what I'm trying to get across to you is that our community and our nations need allies and while a, a, a statement at the beginning um, is what seems to be commonplace right now, um, we have a history uh, in your area. And educating your members, I think, is really important beyond, beyond one statement at the beginning of a game. Yes, now open to suggestions as far as Pardon me, but as far as suggestions as to how we can do that, yeah, I am open to, as I say, any suggestions to respect the Mohawk name, not only the tribe, but also the Lower Mohawks organization. That's all I would. Perfect. Thank you. You know, and open to suggestions, whether it's, uh, I like to 
we want me to communicate a week down the road with Brooke or Chief Sherry Lynn and as far as the email to see if we can do something moving forward within the next week or so, then I'm open to suggestions if you needed some time to. Thanks, Sam. Hazel? Yeah, um, I would just like to say that um, while you're using the name of Mohawk, um, I see no problem with it. I think uh, it what I wrote down here it depicts those words depict strength and honor to use a um, native name for their team, and and that shows respect for the native people. Personally, myself, when I hear a native name being used. I always get that sense that there's that respect. For, it always depicts strength to me when I hear that. Like the Chicago Blackhawks. Now, they had the best logo with the Indian head. And, uh, and even uh, I notice a lot of our Native men, they like that hat. I know yeah. my grandson does. He loves that. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know. I just don't see no problem with using that more. As far as I know, the Chicago Blackhawk uniform is the nice, is the best looking uniform in all the sports. It is, yeah. I like yeah. it. I might not be a Chicago Blackhawk fan, but Me too. it is a beautiful <laughs> jersey. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? If not, um, again, uh, we will be discussed again and we'll get back to you for sure. Okay. And um, thank you for coming in tonight. If there's anything, as I say, uh, Brooke has my email address, and uh, I have any addresses of the recreation director in the center of Wellington, who, as I said before, was a part of the Six Nations community for two years, and he's met a lot of friends over the years, too. Okay. Thank you so much, Dan, for coming tonight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we're running a um, little early. So I know um, recommendation five four, the ethics committee. Um, so she she's here to speak. Yep. Yeah, so we're going to move her to number four. Number four to come now because we're 15 minutes ahead of schedule. Yes. Yep. So the floor is yours, Zach. Okay. Um, good evening, Chief and Council. Uh, thank you for having us here this evening. Um, what we wanted to do is just go through this presentation as a supplementary uh, item to the briefing note that we submitted. So what we wanted to review this evening was some updates that have been done to the research ethics review process. Um, and with that, get approval on the policy changes as well as terms of reference. Um, so this is uh, Cheryl. I'll let Cheryl introduce herself quickly. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Cheryl Dory, and I'm the Community Research Coordinator and Analyst, and I administratively support the, the work and the functions of the Research Ethics Committee. It's nice to be here. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So just a few things wanted to cover uh, this evening, give a bit of background to this work of why the Research Ethics Committee um, needed to be updated in terms of some of the uh, review process. Going to review updates to the protocol itself. So that's essentially the application uh, that the researchers would submit to the committee. Updates to the review process and then just an overall summary. Uh, next slide. Uh, so within the community plan, uh, it states that planning can become a central repository for research, new collaborative studies, transparent data management and monitoring success through indicators outlined in measuring success uh, sections. So that's on page 100 within the community plan. So we just wanted to make note of that. Uh, next slide. 
So uh, a part of uh, a lot of Cheryl's work initially was to look at all research studies that have ever been done in community um, back to the 1960s and forward. And this is some of the data that we were able to find through that work is that currently um, we have no access to the data from the research studies done in community. So around 65%, we don't have any access to those studies that have been done in community. 7% uh, of the studies, the data has been destroyed. Um, and then between 9%, uh, um, that's still a bit ambiguous at this point. And then really we only have around 17% of access to the data um, from past research studies that have been done uh, in community. So you can see that's quite significant. We have a number of research studies that are being done in Six Nations um, that either aren't abiding by OCAP principles or um, that have been done historically and the data is being taken out of community and going with the researchers back to wherever they might have come from. Um, so this was quite eye-opening for us when we first started looking uh, into this more deeply. Uh, next slide. So some of the objectives that we laid out in terms of reviewing how the uh, Research Ethics Committee um, was currently functioning. And again, for those who aren't aware, this was previously a subcommittee uh, under Chief and Council. So research studies would be reviewed at the Research Ethics Committee. Uh, it would then come up to General Counsel for final approval. And then the researchers would then go off and do their work in community after that point. We were finding through that process that um, we wanted to enhance and streamline the administrative processes attached to the committee. We wanted to strengthen the critical ethical review process. We were finding a lot of questions that we were being asked of researchers um, didn't have a real ethical lens to them. They tended to be based upon uh, interests or um, other sort of matters, but there wasn't a research ethical lens tied to a lot of the questions. So we've created a process now that it helps to assist committee members with that, uh, as well as creating a consistent protective factors for Six Nations. So as you can see, as I mentioned earlier, um, over 60% of our data is essentially leaking out of community right now in terms of research. So we wanted to put processes in, processes in place in order to protect uh, our community data, um, as well as looking at future opportunities for community engagement around what type of research does our community want to happen in community. Again, that's sort of a, a, a gap um, within that place. And then finally, monitoring capacity. So that's uh, a lot of the work that Cheryl does in terms of monitoring those studies uh, that we give approval to, um, and then ensuring that they follow processes uh, even after completion of the work in community as well. Next slide. So what we've established so far is a uh, research database to compile all of the research studies that have been done in community. Uh, this has been done to measure trends, um, categorize the different research by different study topics, uh, as well as monitor who actually owns the data currently within those studies, uh, and then tracking each of those studies as well too by project phase, so whether it's active, planning, or if it's been completed. Next slide. So this is uh, just an overall view of what kind of research has happened in communities since the 1960s. Um, so majority of the studies that have been done in community have been related to uh, what we use as the pillars in the community plan. So. The one there is on well-being. So around 31% of studies done in community uh, deal with well-being. The next highest is 24% or Mother Earth or the environment. And then the third one is culture at 18%. And then you can see the others there, uh, employment and education, uh, governance, community, and built environment. Next slide. So this was another question that we wanted to find out in the midst of doing this review work is who is actually leading the research that's done in community? And what we found through this is that a majority of the research that's currently being done in community, uh, around 56% is being led by external uh, people external to the community itself. 31% of the research done in community is done through partnerships. So that's, uh, we'll have external researchers that'll reach out to, uh, whether it's health services or other departments within the organization or even just other community partners. So that's at 31%. And then 13%, which is quite small compared to the rest, is uh, ones that are led directly by um, uh, internal uh, members. Next slide. So a number of the gaps that we identified through a review of this work of the subcommittee was that there is very long ethics review time. So uh, most of the reviews averaged around three and a half months. 
Um, we did find the longest review was nine months. Um, some of the issues with having such a long ethic review process, at times we had researchers that would try to bypass the ethics review process um, simply because they didn't want to wait. They had grant um, uh, requirements that they had to fulfill on their end. So we had researchers that would bypass that process. Um, again, just because of long review, we've had other situations where people just simply left because uh, they didn't want to wait around to get the review done. Um, so there's obviously potential for missed opportunities through that. Um, and then I think just confusion as well, too, on, I know at the, on the committee's end at times, we would have to try to go back and remember what was this person actually here for, pull up all the documents related to it. So it just wasn't a very efficient process. Um, as mentioned earlier, there were limitations in the committee monitoring capacity. So uh, as mentioned before, the researchers would present at the subcommittee, it would then come up to general counsel, they would get approved, but we didn't have a lot of researchers actually coming back at the completion of the study uh, to report back to council on what was being done. Um, so we had not, not a lot of opportunity around uh, monitoring those research studies that were being done in community, uh, as you can see through some of the data I showed earlier. Uh, research protocols, uh, which are essentially applications, were not being evaluated through a research ethical lens. Um, research objectives, as shown through that previous pie chart, uh, they were commonly being dictated by external interests, which again just puts us at risk as a community as well as an, or as an organization. Um, researchers themselves were being put in the driver's seat through the review process. Again, this doesn't help with the context and the historical context that we have in community of what a lot of people refer to as being sort of research to death because we have so many researchers that come in and sort of gather our data and it's not providing benefit back to community. Um, so again, just another risk with having uh, external researchers being in that driver's seat. And then a lar large volume, as I mentioned earlier, of, of our research data from completed studies um, is not either being shared back with the community or is just being lost and is being taken away with the researcher back to whether it's their institution or moving with them. And at times, some, some of the data uh, has even been lost as well, too, as the academic has moved around to different settings as well. Uh, next slide. So what we did uh, within this review process last year is we revised the current uh, research ethics policy uh, with assistance from the policy team uh, here at SNGR. Um, and essentially what we did within that is we increased the expectations put on research applicants. Uh, so that's through the protocols, as well as putting in very clear monitoring procedures and tools within that policy as well. Next slide. So a number of updates that we made to the protocol or application template. Um, so we added in a number of short answer questions, such as uh, related to community risk, um, providing opportunities for community training. So if research projects are coming in, we want to ensure that they're providing opportunities for youth and young adults within the community to get involved or other community members um, so that they're hiring locally, essentially, as well as use of local protocols, uh, plans to respect um, Haudenosaunee knowledge and perspectives, evidence of community engagement in their study rationale, as well as identifying risk level, um, again, depending on the study topic that they're looking into. Next slide. Number of other updates as well, too, to this protocol template was adding in knowledge translation mobilization plan. So again, how are they going to share the results back with community and ensuring that it's a way that's uh, not only understandable, but that is applicable to our setting, as well as planning for participant withdrawal from study. Um, again, that can impact some of the methodologies tied in with the study. So we want to ensure that there's an ethical review within that. Um, looking at research results transition plan. So how are they going to get the research results back to us? Um, within community, as well as providing summary of community engagement. So again, how are they going to do that outreach to get research participants and looking at any sort of budget allocations as well, too. So it's back in community hands. Next slide. Uh, a couple of additional updates that we made to the protocol template. Um, so we are quite firm on this now as an agreement to a commitment to OCAP principles. And essentially what we're doing with that is that will help to be um, uh, a bit of a stop measure for them not to take data out of community and travel with them. So we don't end up in a situation like I showed earlier where over 60% of our research data uh, is not coming back to community. So 
that's a part of that. That's what's known sort of through OCAP principles, researchers that know OCAP, they know they have to uh, respect the First Nation that they're working with and ensuring that they're sharing that data back with uh, community. So we've, we're very clear within the protocol now within that, which wasn't, it was simply just a checkbox before on the old application. Now we've added in a number of different components. So compliance to the Tri-Council policy, uh, as well as ensuring that any researchers that do research in Six Nations, that they complete OCAP training as well. Uh, we've updated Section 7, which is a data management planning questionnaire. Um, so again, if there's any sort of data sharing agreements that need to be made or MOUs or others, again, that they have a plan and process for uh, getting that data back to us. Next slide. So this is what essentially the review process looks like now. Um, so there's two different streams that researchers can take. Uh, the first one is what we call the minimal risk or delegated review stream. So this is done by a single reviewer within the committee. Um, after they review the protocol, uh, either with assistance of Cheryl or on their own, um, they will then send a recommendation to the chair, uh, which is currently myself. And then those revisions requested, um, any sort of uh, revisions that are needed are sent back to the applicant if applicable. Uh, and then once it's all finalized, approval would be delivered by the chair on uh, a written letter back to the research applicant, researcher applicant, sorry. Um, so what we mean by minimal risk is we've used, we've created a matrix to assess that based upon how big the research team is, as well as the topic that they're uh, researching within community. Um, and then there's a whole matrix to decide within that, uh, whether it's a minimal or high risk uh, review that's needed. For the higher risk uh, reviews, so that's what's called a full review. Um, two committee members would review the research protocol. Uh, there was recommendations from that to meet uh, for to a full meeting for me to, uh, to establish consensus essentially within the committee. Uh, and then with those revisions requested back to the applicant, and then the final step would be approval delivered by chair, again, if applicable. Next slide. So this is essentially just an overall review of kind of everything I just covered. Um, so what we've put in place now is we've been really enhanced those expectations on any of the applicants to our research ethics review process. Um, we've now created a very meth uh, methodical review process to be put in place. Um, and then sort of post-approval, we've uh, really strengthened our monitoring of research studies that occur in community as well. And I think that's the last slide. Yeah, so now. Thank you for your presentation. Is there any questions or comments, Cynthia? Yeah, thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> but um, just reflecting on some of your remarks, that um, getting the information, a big part is getting the information back to our own members and expression of the OCAP principles. I was ownership, control, access, and possession. I think it's very important. Do we have a means by which, um, I know different times I've looked on our website, it seems kind of bare. I don't know what happened to all the information on there. It went with the wind. But so when people take the time, people, I mean, our members, take the time to participate in surveys or studies. Can they go somewhere to see what the results are without having to phone up somebody and ask for a report? Do we have a website or something? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we wanted to get approval from Chief and Council first, but then we have a number of things we want to do after the fact uh, with our terms of reference and policy. Uh, and one of them would be to establish a page within the website to review all the work that's done by the Research Ethics Committee. Uh, again, just to make the process really transparent for a community so they know what's being approved, uh, what studies are currently happening in community, um, and then any results as, as we can share, because some of them are private um, and in terms of identifiers to personal individuals. But as best we can, we're going to try to find ways to share any sort of research results back. Um, and again, we're, we're trying to work out different pieces of the website still, um, just so it's not open to anyone or even open to industries or that sort of thing. We want to make it really applicable for community. Um, so whether that ends up being a portal or something else, but uh, it's a lot of sort of next step work that we're looking at. Yep. Craig.
See, that one works. Yeah. It turned off now. There we go. Now it's working. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. I just had a couple of quick uh, questions. Um, one is, um, is uh, what's the um, predominant uh, subject in terms of uh, you find? Was it is it health, environment, demographics? What what do you what do you find? Just generally speaking. Yeah, I would say majority at this point historically, just going back to like I said, the nineteen sixties. Um, would be health related. So that would fall within the uh, well being. So that could be anything from clinical uh, to health programming. Um, we've even had some historical research related to health as well, too. So predominantly health. And I would say probably environment would be the second one after that. A follow up. Yeah. Yeah. Just to follow up that, Zach, um, you were saying about the long ethics review. Um, is, there, is there a way, is there a need to speed that up? And if so, um, what do you what do you need to to do that? So the new process that we've established that we've essentially been piloting now since the fall um, is a lot quicker. So I would say from initial submission to review probably only takes about a month, uh, if not quicker. Um, a lot of it would be based on the researcher now in terms of filling out the form, making sure they have all the supplementary material that's needed. Uh, and then it just from there goes to the reviewer. So they just need to book time to review whatever the protocol is. Um, and all the reviewers, I should have mentioned that in the presentation, it is in the briefing note. Um, all of our committee members are from community as well. So uh, we have Michelle Bomberry. So she carried over from her council position, but then as a community member now, um, Justine um, and Bomberry as well from uh, post secondary, uh, Taylor Gibson from Polytech. And I feel like I'm missing uh, Dwayne Jacobs as well from SNGR. So all community members that review these uh, items that come forward. And yeah, it's a much more efficient process than we had prior as well. Any other questions? Oh, Amos. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, guys, for coming in. Um, I know uh, at well, Greg Luper, you'll know this too, and those of us who work in the university environment, there it, it's a real strict protocol to get ethics clearance from a university to even go to a community to begin your research. Are we accepting that as well, or is that part of the questionnaire that you ask them for, whether they pass ethics within their own faculties? Yeah, so it kind of goes back and forth. Um, like you said, the REBs at the universities, they require community engagement or consultation on their end to even approve right. the study working with First Nations. Uh, but then on our end, I would say majority of it, uh, we expect that to be happening already. Um, but a bit sort of just to be, again, open and transparent about this, the next step for us, if we get approval from this uh, table today, um, is to be able to start actually networking further with the REBs at the different universities so that they are aware of our process, but that we can also hold researchers accountable as well, too. Supplementary. Um, I know there have been a lot of anthropology students or history students coming to the Woodland Cultural Center. So you differentiate those, of, those students or those researchers who just come and use the library, or is it for those researchers who want to have contact with community members? Is there a difference or as far as the ethics goes? Yeah, maybe I'll let Cheryl answer this one. Thanks for the question. Um, so we're sort of setting the tone that the expect thanks. The expectation is that they would submit to us and we could sort of have a nuanced approach to those uh, research applications that are sort of atypical from a TCPS framework, um, but we will review them and and take an individualized approach to responding to those. I was just wondering, because I know there's a lot of, a lot of students, academic students that come to Woodland. I'm, I'm sure the library here as well to just look at the records, what's available. Um, so I think if we're gonna have a process, we might have to train the Woodland Cultural Center yeah. staff as well, because we get a lot of calls. Well, when I was there, a lot of uh, people coming to to just talk with staff even. Um, most of the people that I interacted with were faculty or were researchers, research students, and they would have a protocol where you would have to sign off that you were interviewed. 
So um, I, I know it's all different from different institutions, but I think that's prim primarily what happens is that you have to sign up as being interviewed initially at the Woodland Center, right? Um, so I don't, I don't know how we can, we're gonna try and gather that information too, right? Yeah, I think that can be definitely part of our next steps of looking at sort of just that further networking and ensuring that our community knowledge is well protected um, and it's not being shared unnecessarily. Yep. Okay, so there's a resolution. Uh, Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council approved the changes being made to the Research Ethics Committee to allow for a more streamlined process in the work of the committee, which will include quarterly updates to Chief and Council on the work of the committee, as well as enhanced transparency of the work of the committee for community members' awareness. Moved by Greg. Is there a seconder? Amos, all in favor? Be opposed? See none carried. Wave second reading. Greg, second by Amos. All in favor? Anybody opposed? See none carried. Okay, thank you. So let's go back. We'll go back to number two, Arlene. Yeah, um, we can bring your chair up. We can bring the chair up for you. Can you grab it? Oh, oh this one. We got this one for you. Good evening, Arlene. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, um, so welcome. I've gotten their proposal about a can you just push your mic one more time? Yep, there you go. It's the red's on. Okay. So I can just leave it now? Yep, you can oh. leave it now. <laughs> oh, <it's... laughs> okay. I'm uh just a grandma and mama and six nations um but i wanted to have something for the youth young people so in 2000 my mother-in-law norma martin my husband and i we started to give away food across from jc hill by the end of the summer um we had about 40 kids we were feeding so i asked them is there anything that six nations isn't doing for you that we could do for you they said they wanted to play so I approached council and they gave us the money for computer and all. Like I think they gave us sixteen thousand, and we rent. We hired people from Toronto, the best of the best, to, to teach uh, stage fighting and masks and lights and sound. And we went to Woodland Cultural and they trained there for the whole summer. And they came into my home and wrote a play they wanted to do on residential school, and out of it came one voice, many stories. A phenomenal play where uh, I can get a copy if anybody wants to see it. But that's where my heart has been for the youth and the children of Six Nations. And so I ran into Steve Williams last year and I asked him why we don't have a pool for the kids. He said we just need one community member to write a letter. So I wrote him the letter. And, and I didn't think it came into council until I ran into Amos. Because I gave it to the last council and I never got a call back and they wouldn't return my calls. So that's why I'm here. Thanks, Amos. The presentation is, is if you've read it all, it speaks for itself. I have uh, Lee, the owner, he'll, he'll be online. Or he'll let me call him if you have any specific questions. I'm a grandma and a mom. I don't know specifics. I have a heart for this community and I'll keep pushing through till we get this pool. We've already approached uh, community trust. My friend right now is uh, filling out that application on behalf of Six Nations Community Youth Outreach, acronym SINCIO. Through the years, we SINCIO has been we were established in 2000, but through the time we've uh, had free community events. So this will just be another Another thing we want to dig our heels into and try to bring to pass. 
and we want it to be a community geared and steered pool. The one that we, uh, Steve Williams and I went to see one in Oakville, one this gentleman had just finished. It was absolutely amazing. It was uh, all stainless steel. He knows a lot about the Gretzky pool. They did a part, I don't know, was a re remodel or something at Gretzky pool. But he said that uh, because they made it out of concrete, I think it's on the first letter page that I sent, that it shrunk two inches. And now it's not Olympic size anymore. So this one's stainless steel. It'll never shrink. He's got uh, where they'll be employed for cleaning 10 to 13 people. This pool will take two people. He's got the, the system is is amazing how the water flushes out and cleans while it's flushing back in. It's but he'll come if you guys want to talk to him. Um, he's on the phone if you need to have any ask any questions. And I think that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments regarding the pool? Yeah, Amos. I, I just I, I'm not a swimmer. I'm a dog paddler, but I still like water. So, <laughs> I mean, I go to the ocean at least once a year. Um, I always thought about this in our community. I think the same thing with your heart, right? Um, especially with the Olympics coming on, we're going to see a lot of swimming in the Olympics this summer. I just, I just think, I know there must be young people in this community that could trained to that caliber of Olympic swimming. And I, and we don't have the facility for it, whether it's recreational or training. Um, is that going to be a combination of both, like recreation for people who just want to swim, and then those that want to train for that kind of? Yes, we already thought of that. That's already in the plan. OK. So I, I just I just think that's it's we're due for a pool for this community. And um, I support Ar Arlene's uh, request here to get our interest tonight. Any other questions, comments? Uh, Cynthia? Yeah, I want to swim too. As long as the water is warm. <laughs> I'm a big chicken. Now. Well, the plan is kind of modeled after Gretzky, so there'll be a pool for Pete seniors who want to rest their bones, and a, a length pool for Olympic swimming, and then a family pool, a child's pool. And he's he'll, if he was here, he'd be able to say it better, but Coming up the steps will be a place just for children who can't go past the belly buttons. But then he has an idea of uh, up to the side. Uh, um, can I the name code? I can't think. It'll come back to me. But if we could even get enough money to have a, a rubber running track, that would be extra than, than, he, than what he's quoted. And so he came down, he seen the property. Um, we went behind the count, behind the community hall. You know, who told us there was, Mark. Mark said there was property back there that was ready for a pool, but no money. And I said, we have, we're getting the money, but no, no spot. So we said, well, we can collaborate, but that's the last time we talked about it. There was no other discussion. So I took the contractor back behind the uh, community hall and he's seen a place where they could build it. And so it would be attached to the community hall. You could walk right through it too. So there's been some, some footwork, not a lot, but, uh, and Steve's comment to Lee was, because he said, do you want us to build a building? And he said, we're known as steel workers and we'd like to build our own building. So, okay, Cynthia? Yeah, and I, that budget price there, is that for everything he's got a, a budget price in there? Or yeah, that's, that's for the, the track would be extra okay. and the building is obviously extra. That's for the pool and it, it's running and. I couldn't see, but. Um, one of the concerns with, because I love the idea of a pool, but one of the concerns always is it's relatively speaking easier to get capital than the slippery slope is the O&M after. 
have you managed to have any discussions with Cheryl or talking about that? For no, an ongoing no, this basis? is my first stop. Okay. But um, I approached every money guy on the res, gave them a proposal, and they're all interested, but they're waiting to, for somebody to initiate it. So what I'm proposing to do to them is ask them if they can give a certain amount yearly for the maintenance. I know the maintenance is going to be the real problem. I've talked to, go ahead. Follow up. Well, you're, you're, you're a good community member. I must say, I applaud you for talking to all these people with money. <laughs> Whilst we're asking for money, it would be good to get the, um, would you say the running track is in addition to the 4.5, but in it, what would be really good is if we could get a few million extra, but actually put it in a trust, especially for the pool because it could earn um, interest every year, you know, with the investments, yeah. earn interest and help pay for the um, the upkeep of the pool and whatever has to be done. Well, only need, you said two people versus nine people. Yeah. So it sounds like yeah. you've got a lot of work and I applaud you. Oh, thank I you. look forward to swimming in the warm water. <laughs> Melba? Yes, uh, thanks for being here, Arlene. Nice to see you. Yeah, I think this has been a gap for quite a few years, and uh, past councils thought it's too costly. Who's going to take care of it? But we got to go beyond that, again, of the need for the community, which is why you're here. So I think it's great that it's a good idea and uh, certainly should be looked at seriously. And where the land is that it may be placed on is needs to be explored, I think. Yeah, I guess... Uh, Mark at the time had had a had an idea that we do have the land. So, uh, you didn't mention a therapeutic uh, sort of component to it. If if Lee was here, he's got a lot of ideas, but they're they're all add-ons. So, okay. and if, if you want him to come, he'd be happy to come. He'd be happy to speak on the phone tonight. Whatever mm -hmm. he said, whatever we need. He's ready and waiting for Zoom. Yeah. Is he? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's great. If we could hear have Steve uh, come forward and sort of add to what you're saying, just in case. Uh, Steve was supposed we to need a uh, little got, bit of got coverage stuck further. Pardon? Yeah. Um, he was there. He was here. Did a little bit. Remember when he reported a little bit before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, he was caught in traffic. No, he he's caught in a meeting in Toronto. In, in Toronto. Okay. Um. Yeah. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, well, thanks for coming in, Arlene. Yeah, I used to swim a lot, almost every day. Um, so yeah, I, I don't swim anymore. My shoulders can't really take it. But um, the thing is, is that we did have a short discussion. I, I think Little NHL was uh, they were um, they were using the city of Markham and the, re the arenas, and we did um, speak with the mayor there. Um, did you get a chance to see the the operation in, in Markham? And, and how it operates and, and get the, a feeling from, yeah. No, we only went to Oakville. Oh, okay. Right, because here I could see it was, um, there was some mention of Markham, the city of Markham having one of these pools, right? Is that correct? And okay, good. Because I think it would be good for, well, I'd even go to have a look at, you know, the operation, see how it works and-, and Yeah, he'll plan a day and whoever wants to go up and go and ask whatever questions you want, because you'll great. just be amazed. Great, thank you. The word I was looking for earlier was autism. He has a spot so children can play. The moms can be there running the track and there could be a spot for autistic children. He's already designed it and it's working in some areas. Nice. So just with some discussion, um, Dean is the chair of um, community, the community committee. So for um, to hook, to be able to go to that committee, to be to do more due diligence and to work with you and to take some of those to go for a tour and stuff. Um, he'll be able to do more to move it forward. Okay. Yeah. Now, should you pass it, I think there was a request on there for someone to help us with proposal writing. I'd like to have that dealt with tonight too, please. Um, so with that, I think um, Dean will be able to help you with that at, at the committee level. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So with all that, he'll be able to help you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. 
And thank you for coming in. Great idea. And like Melba said, it's been <laughs> overdue, long overdue. <laughs> yes. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great night. Okay, let's go to number three, Six Nations Agricultural Society Fair Board. <laughs> You need another chair? You coming up? <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> okay. Good evening and welcome. Yes. Press my button. There you okay. go. Okay, the floor is yours. Well, we'd like to thank you, Chief, and elected council for seeing us tonight and uh, for your ongoing support to the fair. Um, the Six Nations Agricultural Society Fair Board is pleased to announce that this year's fair dates from September 6 to 8, 2024, is going to be our 155th fair. <clears throat> We plan to celebrate with amusement rides, agricultural events, and our usual dedicated Kids Day, the ambassador program. We're trying to bring back a 4-H presentation this year. We, um, Six Nations doesn't have its own, but we're working with um, Hagersville and Caledonia um, to see if we can get some community members involved. There is interest from the community, but it's getting... Uh, some of the farmers and the kids back involved with animal husbandry. Um, and the Farmers Association in conjunction with that, with some other programs. Um, we've also had, um, we have, um, if we bring back agriculture, we also have a couple community uh, members who are willing to support and sponsor um, Indigenous prizes towards the winners as well as cash prizes. So that would be good for our youth. And it would be from ages from eight to 20 is what we're gearing for this year. Um, and if we can go bigger down the road, that would be absolutely amazing. But as you know, we're running out of fairgrounds too. Um, we support the pool and all that, but that, that's gonna take away from some of our activities in the back. Um, Cause right now we're just that, that little patch there and the racetrack kind of thing and that strip going back to the barns. So we do need some building upgrades as well. Um, we're also having some concerts. Our Saturday and Sunday are geared towards, uh, this year gonna be local talent. So um, we're in the works with a lot of local entertainers. And then uh, we'll have our tribute band on the Friday night. And we're looking at some other entertainers as well. Um, even bringing some who have moved away. Some are talking about maybe coming home for for the Saturday evening. Um, we have three days of fun fair for the community and our friends from surrounding areas. In order to have a successful event, we need assistance with covering costs. Some of the costs would in include the musical acts for concerts, stage, the wrestling, demolition derby, kids day activities, Red Barn, our tents, we need two buildings that one to house the 4-H, which the um, we've had someone look at that stainless steel building that's run down at the front of the property. Structurally inside that building is sound. So we're just feeling out for costs to have the outside done, like refurbished so that we can hold events in there. And then the blue building that used to be the sound and stage for the racetrack and that, um, it needs to be redone. It has a bird problem. So we're looking into hiring somebody to have it cleaned out, like professionally cleaned and then sealed around so the birds can't get back in. Um, our other costs are the portable tents, porta potties, decorations, prizes, 
Uh, security. We do need to up security this year. Uh, we had a couple possible incidents last year, but nothing that major. We were able to cut them down. So we need our security costs this year are going to be a lot higher. Um, we've talked to Six Nations Police, but apparently they don't have the manpower. Um, so we are looking to an outside security company. Um, we also have um, our advertising. And uh, the biggest cost is, of course, our midway rides. Um, we've done research into mid midway companies in our area and we discovered that there are a lot of them aren't in business anymore and a lot aren't taking on new clients. Um, and they're becoming very far and few between. So the ones that are set for fares are pretty much set where they're at and they don't want to move or take on new, new clients. Um, and just seeing here. Oh, the past support from Six Nation Council has been a tremendous help and we'd like to discuss future uh, opportunities um, with Six Nations Agricultural Society has that could benefit community events and more specifically create a draw at our fall fair. The purpose of this letter is to ask Six Nations Council for a monetary donation to help us run our 2024 fair as we are discussing an annual commitment. Um, we're trying to get people to commit every year and come back, not only as volunteers, but any monetary support that we can get. And we really, like last year, our fair was a little bit bigger and better. So we're hoping to make it bigger and better again this year. It is our 155th fair. And we're the largest Indigenous fair still running. And uh, so that right there says a lot for us. Um, we've been working hard at monthly meetings to organize, plan, and structure all events as we strive to grow and become the best Indigenous Fall Fair. And we look forward, we look to our community leaders to lend us the support to do so. Uh, please consider in supporting and working together with the, the board and volunteers with a donation to make this year's Six Nations Fall Fair a memorable one um, for our community and our friends. And then we've also prepared, um, I think uh, you were given the, the budget I think uh, Teresa passed that forward. Um, and Millard's is, Millard's is doing our, our budget. Yeah, we're this year. Oops. Yeah, go ahead. We are getting our uh, financials records this year uh, actually audited. We had them looked at by a uh, the Albert group in the community, and they, they've signed a letter saying that they're good and stable, and they're moving that on to Millard's to actually be audited. And that'll help us with uh, reporting to council and also any other sponsors or lending groups, as well as any grants and stuff that we can try and access. Do you have anything else that I've forgotten? Or? Um, the other thing we wanted to ask council too is um, our understanding is last year we had a problem. Our, um, we needed access to the internet and we were told that that only Parks and Rec could use it and only Council. So we wanted to know if we could access the internet. It's only for it's only for our um, our treasurer and whoever's in our money area for any financials that they need to do where they need interact net access. Um, and we were told we couldn't have that. So it's only for the three days. I guess, no, it would be the Thursday for the setup as well. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday. And Sunday, sorry, yes. Um, and, and that's all it would be. Otherwise, we'd have to go into the expense of purchasing our own and for the three days. So I don't know who we approach or if you can. Yeah, we that. can look into that for sure. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. And uh, um, the other thing we were trying to do is, is uh, we've been having a little bit of difficulty getting more involved with Parks and Rec, um, trying to get, like, we think the pool is a great idea and that, and then a running track and that, but that whole back area when there's nothing going on, we don't have access to. Like we used to be able to have events, 
like we had more room for, let's say, our um, our barrel racing, our rodeo riders, our, our Western show and that. We don't have any of that anymore. We've lost it to Ball Diamonds. There's no area there. We have our racetrack, and we've just got that narrow strip. And for some people, we're going to try it. look at refurbishing back at the horse barns there. There's some stalls there so we can increase for 4-H. Um, but because of the sprinkler systems and that, we're losing, we're losing grounds and our parking is very limited because now our midway has to be in the parking lot. And that's where all our fare pretty much has to take place. So we try not, we'd like to not lose any more fairgrounds if possible. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, our dog show we had to do in the ball diamond last year. And uh, so I don't know if there's anything council can assist us with, with parks and rec and Again, we can, we'll help you with that because again, that's under Dean also. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dean's Dean. right in the, he's got a list going. <laughs> yeah. We've so, got a list for you, Dean. Yeah. <laughs> so Parks and Rec is under um, the community committee. So he's getting your list going. <laughs> yeah. Like we've got, um, I don't know if, if you were given a copy of our schedule, but we've got a tentative schedule for this year's fair. And uh, we have a lot of uh, outside programming going on. Like our our barrel racing, our um, our Western horse show that we'd like to bring back, our Raptors area and that, but it's kind of divided to ball areas which aren't easily accessible to our elders. Um, even though we run shuttles, we've we're increasing our shuttles this year by two more larger carts. So we've got to add that into our budget as well to for different events like where people want to go. But if it's at the back of the baseball field, it's hard for elders to cross the track and get get back there. So we're trying to make things as accessible as possible. Um, Anything else? Oh, yeah, we have our... There's lots of stuff. Oh, yeah, there's all kinds of more stuff. Yeah, our trade show is almost full. The arena is almost fully booked for inside and out. And our food a, vendors. It's a lot of local as well as outlying community art people. So they'll be bringing other community members like to come or outside community coming in to see what we've got in the trade show. Uh, the reason why we had come to council every year, the fair board needs to ask for a donation to help. Our biggest cost is that we're finding is the rides. The um, person that the company that we used last year has approached us and said, if we could get a commitment from you, we could purchase a larger ride that will always be available for you. Something like the Gravitron or what was it? The a, big Ferris wheel. The big a Ferris, big Ferris wheel. wheel. Not a, and um, and so we said we would try. We would approach a couple uh, community sources along with Six Nations Council to see if we could get a, like the letter says, an annual commitment so that we may offer that as well and get uh, money towards he wanted a five-year contract in order for us to, and that we would lock in that price. So even though every year everything would go up, he would he would uh, honor the fact that we locked in a contract for five years. Oh, and the other thing we said we'd, we'd mention as well is um, in a commitment like this, that that ride would also be available for Solidarity Day and bread and cheese. So it it was like we're trying to, include other community events that that would benefit our community i'm glad you guys said that because that's what nathan just said yeah that he's going to work with dean and to make the package so we can do all the events together yeah yeah and we've also had a couple of vendors who um were with with different carnival type things who are interested in attending like they've kind of gone independent so they're interested in attending our bread and cheese and our solidarity day so we've referred them to council to um check with you and see if you're you're interested because we're getting more and more crowds for both events so um shirley did you hear that <laughs> shirley's on she's just on the oh, thing here <laughs> yeah oh oh here she comes on shirley yeah yeah so yeah that's um lol it's good to hear <laughs> Um, and as a matter of fact, with regards to the rides, um, we did collaborate with GTA Midways last year, 
um, and he gave us a collaborated price uh, because we included uh, the three events, which included Bread and Cheese, Solidarity Day, and the Fair Board, um, and which gave us seven midway rides um, inclusive of um, free um, candy floss and um, something else. There was one other item. Um, but um, I'm not sure about the five-year commitment, but of course that'll be up to the to, to the committee, but um, yeah, we are familiar with um, Mr. Lieberman and um, the other fellow there. I can't remember his name, but anyway, yes. Good to know, we can work together, save us some money. Thank yes, you, sir. Shirley. Uh, Thank you. Cynthia, you're good? Okay. Yeah, we didn't work with the GTA last year. Um, we worked with another company. Um, the two companies that we were working with, uh, unfortunately, their rides were not satisfactory and were not safe. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they had to pull them. So um, it came right down to kind of the last last minute. But um, I know some of you might have noticed that there was a couple of big rides there that were being dismantled. And we had asked them to have them removed for health and safety reasons. Um, one was going to be put up anyways, even though it was missing 24 bolts. So um, we like to have them inspected. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it's like, hey, sorry, if we won't get on them, our community's not going to get on them. <laughs> Amos? Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you brought up the Wi-Fi thing because um, the, the Language Commission is having an event at a community hall and they don't have access to the Wi-Fi. So is there any reason for that? And that's my first question. Secondly, couldn't we just also buy or install a public Wi-Fi that's unsecured? Because then when you go on it, you'll know that it's unsecured. But I know the recreation probably have to have a secured Wi-Fi, which is fine. But I mean, for the general public, if, for events like this, it's a selling point if there's free Wi-Fi, wi wi yeah. if I say it right, on, on during the event. So I think we should look at that, getting a, a public Wi-Fi for events at the community hall. Yep. Go ahead, Nathan. Yeah, I was just going back and forth with um, uh, Zach, and, and we are looking at that kind of a, a third-party service provider outside of our network uh, to be able to provide that. And I'm also looking and talking with a few sponsors who will uh, be able to sponsor that kind of uh, hotspot available, not only at the community hall, but also at some of our other venues. Uh, because if we are hosting meetings and, and folks are coming in, we got to be able to provide Wi-Fi. So um, definitely looking into that. But the big thing is I want to get a sponsor to do that as well. Because we're going to need it for this, the annual meeting of the Chiefs of Ontario. Yeah. If we're hosting it, we're going to mm -hmm. need Wi-Fi here yeah. all over. And just a note, I, I did work with the Language Commission to find a solution, so. The other thing we were looking, we were, oh. I would like to hear from all of you councillors what you think about the fair and how it's um, set up and, you know, what you think. Like, is it good? Is it bad? Like, I mean. What can we do to improve? Um, for myself, I think I think it's great. I had a lot of fun last year. Um, it was busy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> but um, I think that it's just working together in the support and to reach what you guys want to do to enhance it, you know, because it's for the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, to enjoy themselves, but also with their families. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else wants to. Um, go ahead, uh, Melba. Yeah, I found... Uh, certainly an improvement over uh, concerning the the vendors that were there. I think they, the community appreciated having a variety and the colors that you you had displayed. That was really uplifting. Yeah, so I find it was an improvement and hopefully it'll continue that way. Yeah, for the whole community, something for all the community. Yeah. And certainly uh, paying respects to the elders who can't get from one area to another. So that's really great. So glad you're coming forward and asking for more help because it's necessary. Again, 
It's a need for the community. It's part of our healing, having fun and meeting. It's like bread and cheese. Mm -hmm. You're going to meet people that you haven't seen for a while, for example, and have a little chit chat. So it's really fun if you can get out there and, and, and uh, talk with other people and visit and eat the good food, which we shouldn't be eating at times, <laughs> but it's very good. Thank He's you. So Well, I think the fair is growing and it's getting better every year since that time when it was taken over by other people to run. Um, each year you see it growing bigger and bigger and better and better. The one thing that I've noticed is um, the schools, how we used to um, draw and hopefully get our <laughs> chicken scratches into the fair. <laughs> I think that needs to be promoted with the schools that they'll have more um, displays brought in and maybe a competition for the school to, you know, win a prize, something like that to make the schools put more effort into getting some things into the hall. Well, we do have our, our books have come out. Our, well, they're going to be on PDF this year. Mm -hmm. um, but for those who can access them, they're also going to be in the hard copy like they were. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been revamped and they are going to be available and they will be going out to the schools, to each of the individual schools, so they can plan their programming around what the, what the entries are. Oh, yeah. okay. And we did have a lot more entries last year than we had previous years. And um, all our entrants were paid on the Sunday. So there was no, we didn't get any complaints that nobody got paid for their entries or mm -hmm. whatever they entered and, and we did have a lot more uh, community involvement and a lot more community feedback on, you know, we're getting we're getting a lot more community businesses as well that sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, so we appreciate that as well, and uh, we appreciate everybody's everybody's support and all the help that we can get. And we're trying to accommodate every age group that's there. From we're bringing back the senior smokes dance this year, mm -hmm. so that's come back, and then. Uh, the Wild West show that used to work with the Sky family. We're getting a lot of uh, vendors who previously worked with Six Nations for years are interested in coming back. Good. So that was nice to hear. We were just at a convention and we're also hosting on April 20th, we're hosting the District 7 meeting, which is all the fair boards. Um, we had a little bit of problems finding a space to secure 100 to 120 people from all different regions. Um, but we finally ended up having to get the gathering place and even assistance there for, for spots or sponsorship would be greatly appreciated mm -hmm. um, because it's it's expensive. Uh, we understand the community hall was booked. So, so even little things like that that we could use assistance with is greatly appreciated. Yeah, there was well, just one more thing that I always thought would work for a fair, and that's if you could get somebody from, uh, let's say, Nashville. <laughs> oh, we <laughs> tried talking about Ricky Skaggs, but <laughs> that's going to take a I big sponsorship. Vince Gill oh. to come. <laughs> Who? Vince Gill. Vince Gill? Mm -hmm. That's going to take a lot of money. I hope you got it in your budget. <laughs> But we'd no, love but, to, yeah. But you like, know what? Uh, Jim Jacobs knows a lot of people in Nashville because he's been down there quite a while. I'm going to ask him if he can recruit somebody to come to the fair and give us a price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, that would be one where we'd have to get a bigger venue. Our little stage wouldn't accommodate in the community. Like, that would draw in, you'd draw in hundreds of people more than what we do with somebody like that. But yeah, that would be great. Can I just say in response to Hazel that we've um, in the last few months, the fair board, we've had a lot more community members coming and, and participating and signing up to be part of the, the committee to look after it all. And there, we've actually have a couple people who are going to go into the schools with the book okay. and talk to the teachers and talk to the kids and show them, you know, what kinds of things that they can submit and help them get through that process mm -hmm. so that we can have some more uh, applicants from the schools for the fair for this year. Oh, that sounds yeah. good. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, Carrie? Yeah, the, I noticed I dropped my girl up there last year for the fair. And I noticed the smells and the sounds was almost back to where it was like 25, 30 years ago. But when I went to pick my girl up at the, at the end of the night, she said, Dad, there was no adult rides. So, she, she, so that was one thing that was... And that Other than is, that, it was good. Yep, and that's what we're trying to work towards. We've asked uh, the person that gave us a proposal. We've asked for larger rides, for teenage rides, for larger yeah, rides. Yeah, that's and and we're trying to work towards that, but... It's expensive. It's very. Amos? Uh, yeah, just to tell you, um, I don't know whether very many people have horses anymore in this community, but we gave away tickets on a radio station on, last week for that event in Ancaster about horses and and every time they went online to to say we got this, these tickets available the thing just lit up so people are interested in horses too i i was surprised uh when they were saying these light these telephone lines are lighting up the people want to go and see horses and that was at ancaster last week i don't know what kind of event it was but they they sponsored those tickets and so I don't know what if we can get back to horses maybe that for me is i like horses well we're working at it <laughs> and we do have a tentative commitment for 2026 um yeah for the for the mini chuck wagons with uh yeah and we've got the barrel racing coming back this year yeah and uh possibly we're just waiting for a yay or nay for date clearance on the um the old west show they used to work with the Sky family. So we are trying to b bring them back. But a big thing, again, is having our buildings refurbished so that they can store their horses overnight instead of having to transport them back and forth, which kind of causes a little bit of a, you know, if they're just here for a day, it causes a little bit of traffic jam because they're up front. And then also, again, to put on a show at the very back, it's not as accessible back there. A lot of people don't know that there's even still barns back there. Uh, Follow up. Uh, yeah, just follow. I, I don't know if this is true, but I heard there was a family in on the territory here that had prize winning Clydesdales or something. Mm -hmm. So, like, I haven't seen them, but I would that be something to see too. Yeah, that there. would be. And I know there's a there's. A, couple of farms in, in the Brant area that have big Clydesdales that are beautiful, they were telling me. And I mean, I, I, I mean, this is for a meeting, but I know we shouldn't be, but I just love horses, so I don't know. Uh, it's a weird day. Eh? Uh, Greg, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, ladies, for coming in. Um, yeah, I was on the fair board for a couple of years and had to do a little bit of volunteering. So that's good to hear that people are interested in, in volunteering. And that's that's something actually we could send out to the community that, you know, volunteers are welcome, right? Because I, I know that uh, even just getting the property ready for the fair was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing too is that livestock always is, is a different part of the fair. I don't, many fairs don't have li uh, livestock or, or animals that much anymore. Yeah. I, I remember I was in charge of operating the, uh, the greasy pig operation. Greasy pig, yeah. You um, want to come back and do it again this year? Uh, <laughs> no, I think Peter, Peter might have. Uh, they didn't, you know, they didn't think too fondly of that uh, that operation because the poor pig. But the ch the children really loved it. But um, again, uh, uh, yeah, the other little thing too is tourism as well. I think we could make sure you know tourism is aware and they start promoting it. We do yeah. have we do have somebody yeah. on tourism who sits on our board, right? Yeah, and then so brought up. So we that's work good. we work with them, and and we work with tourism for our for our district meeting, right there. Um, right, well, and then right. we might approach council too for some swag if you've got any swag to throw in the bag to for the different <laughs> any kind of swag to throw in the bag. No, so like pens or notepads <laughs> or stuff like that, just to you know, oh follow up. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you, what would you be asking the uh, council for in terms of a, a monetary amount? 
we were looking at, um, I think it was 120, 120,000, if mm -hmm. that's doable. Um, that would cover our costs and our budget. Um, our total expenses, our total expenses for, um, is that 2023 or 2024? This is our budget for this year. Oh. So our budget for this year is estimated at uh, three, two, oh, oh, sorry. Our budget for this year is estimated at $246,000. So with, uh, we're going to go after uh, council, of course, and of course, other communities, uh, sponsorship, uh, some income, the revenue that will be coming in to help offset those costs, our exhibitors and our vendors, uh, that'll be what our uh, income is going to be based on this year, as well as um, our admission. Okay, so thank you for coming in. Um, Dean has written it all down, so he'll help you um, get all the stuff that you. So asked. you'll be our main point of contact. Yes. Okay. And also, um, we haven't did our budgets yet, so once we do our budgets, we'll make sure that um, it's on there, and um, we'll get back to you. Well, thank you very much, and we hope to see you all at the fair for sure. I'm signing Yama. up already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Council, uh, let's go to number five. COVID-19 response evaluation. Um, that's Zach Miller and Deborah Jonathan. So hello again, uh, Council. Um, don't have a presentation like I did prior. So actually what I'm going to do is just review different pieces of the briefing note, um, just so publics, uh, the community is aware of what the proposal is. Um, and obviously we can answer any questions at the end of that as well. So on April 1st, 2024, uh, so next month, uh, Six Nations of the Grand River will be commemorating over four years since its response to the global COVID-19 pandemic began. Uh, began which ushered in a period of adaptation within the community due to those uncertain times. Over this time, a multitude of initiatives were taken and critical decisions were made to safeguard the health and well-being of our members amidst the uncertainty. As we draw this chapter of our response to a close, it is imperative to reflect on those efforts, uh, ensuring their effectiveness, safety, and, and identifying methods for improvement should similar emergencies arise in the future. Um, so in light of this uh, work, uh, we were asked, uh, Deb and myself were asked by the executive team, the CEO team, um, if we could take this work on to evaluate the response, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic response that we put forward as an organization. Um, so what we've started to do since that time is uh, look at ways to comprehensively review our response over those years. Um, we've brought together a, a sort of working group or committee um, which is comprised of Sarah Smith, so our senior epidemiologist, uh, Melissa Ricuti, who's a senior manager of the professional practice office, um, uh, Maggie Gallant, who's uh, my executive assistant, and Jennifer Smith, who's the executive assistant for DEP. Uh, each of these members were chosen for their historical work in relation to the pan our pandemic response, uh, as well as admin skills to assist in the evaluation of our response. Um, so we've also created a terms of reference, which I attached with the briefing note. Uh, essentially what we're doing, planning to do is review all of the documentation that was compiled uh, over that period of time with the response, um, as well as uh, interview ECG and IMT members uh, to better understand decisions that were made. Um, we'd love to open that up as well too, to pass uh, members of council, uh, if applicable. Um, so essentially what we want to do is do that work over the next summer months. We have a set a timeline to complete it over the next year uh, and then complete that work with a sort of what we heard report uh, back to community 
um, so that they can be aware of uh, what the evaluation results showed as well. Um, I forgot to mention sort of as a part of the introduction, uh, both Deb and I's roles in the midst of the pandemic. Um, so for myself, I'll let Deb uh, res uh, respond in a second. Um, but for myself, I, I led uh, the IMT planning section, um, which essentially gathered all of the data and research tied to our pandemic response. Um, so I did that within the first year uh, in uh, over 2020 and then into early 2021. Um, I was also at the time leading the family health team, so ensured that our clinic uh, was up to standards and protected over that time. Uh, and then eventually led our vaccine, uh, helped to co-chair our vaccine task force, which helped to bring the vaccines into community uh, over that time. I'm not sure, Deb, if you want to just add something briefly. Sure. So my role uh, in the pandemic, I was a support and part of the emergency control group for the former director of health. Um, it was a large public health response. So public health at that time, I was the um, nurse in charge. So we were really supporting health with getting things moving and off the ground. Um, also writing a proposal so that we could have our own assessment center in our community. So it was a lot of the preparatory work. Um, as a community, I do feel like we acted quickly. Uh, we actually started to meet informally as soon as we started to hear the first um, rumors of, of something brewing in, in Wuhan. So our first meeting was actually in January where it was, it was you know, informal, but just to come together so that people could start having the dialogue and, and looking at what we had in place and what we needed to do. Um, so a lot of our, our public health work started to happen quite early on. Thank you. Um, so yeah, essentially what we're looking to do is uh, get the support of council to start this evaluation work. Um, we're planning to start it, uh, start doing some of the more of the formal planning for it next month and then start doing the actual evaluation work in the months ahead. Um, to sort of uh, start some of this work as well too, as we're uh, planning to host an event at the community hall on April 27th as a community healing event. Uh, the purpose of this event will to serve as a holistic platform for the community um, to give space to community members to bring closure to the pandemic and the uncertain times we faced, as well as a time to honor those that we lost uh, in the midst of the pandemic as well too. Um, so we're uh, hoping to give out more information on that event uh, within the coming weeks because we know it's it's coming up quite quickly. Um, but that once again, that'll be April 27th at the community hall. Uh, I believe that's a Saturday. Uh, and we're planning to sort of a late morning into the early afternoon. Um, hoping to have some guest speakers at the event as well too to help sort of guide us through um, that, uh, that sort of space of healing and to ensure that uh, um, all, all community members feel honored and respected uh, in the midst of that process as well. Um, at the end of the what we heard report, when we were able to eventually compile that as well too at the end of the evaluation, we're hoping to provide an opportunity to not only give the report more formally to community, um, but also within that to provide a space to um, really honor and acknowledge the various number of workers that we had to help with the response. So those in ECG at the time, those in IMT, um, a number of our first responders and frontline workers who were instrumental in um, in protecting our community um, throughout those those uh, years. Um, we just want to really formally present sort of a, have a space for that acknowledgement. Um, I, I think what happened with the pandemic is we we were so uh, very intensely into it over those years, and then as things sort of gradually changed, we just kind of all phased out of it. But that didn't happen for everyone. And uh, we kind of moved past it uh, sort of gradually, but also quickly in a way as well, too. And we just didn't really give that space, um, not only for closure, like I said, for community, but also as a way to acknowledge uh, those who were a part of the response uh, within community as well, too. So we want to give that space to them. Um, we're planning, um, like I said, we're planning to do this evaluation work over the next year. Um, it might not take the full year, but that's sort of the timeline that we're setting right now uh, and hoping to give an interim update uh, six months from now as well, too, just in terms of our current progress and some of the initial findings as well, too, from the evaluation. Um, and I think that's it, unless there's any questions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Greg? Uh, yeah, thanks for coming in. Um, 
because uh, there's a lot of uh, vaccine reluctance in the community. Um, uh, I'm a big proponent of, of getting vaccines, and um, but is there are you going to be looking at it as well? Not only just the COVID, but just generally speaking, uh, the reluctance to get a vac uh, vaccination and some of the other vac uh, vaccines that are available that'll be helpful to our community. Yeah, so that, that'll be a part of the work. Um, like I said, we're essentially looking at the full comprehensive response. So the vaccine rollout, education, um, all of that was a part of the response itself to the pandemic. Um, we are also going to be pulling on any sort of research studies that were done over that time as well, too. One of them being the COVID-19 uh, community study that was recently completed as well. Um, so we'll be pulling information out of that, too, around vaccine hesitancy uh, and seeing if there's any sort of additional work that we can do within that space as well. Cynthia? Yeah, I look forward to this process. I was wondering, had it been done, I had asked and not for various reasons. But and uh, I think back in the early, mid 80s, you probably were a child not born yet. <laughs> um, we did have a, a state of emergency here, it was a, a trail derailment. And of course we, um, called together emergency response group. We operated out of the public works boardroom back then. And I actually chaired the response group. And I realized things have changed a whole lot over the years, but I do remember when we were at the end, end of the state of the emerg emergency for the derailment, we had, I'm trying to remember, I think it was a public meeting as part of the going back to do a report. And I remember there were basic things I think we worked with Emergency Measures Ontario, and they were saying for this, don't get, don't, don't try to get too um, detailed. Keep it simple. It's like, and that was open to all to give feedback to us. Is what did we do well? We always want to know what we did well because certainly we always do something well, right? What did we do well, and what things could we improve upon? And what we advised our whole team that was going to be there is we need to hear all of this, especially what can we do to improve? Like it's not people attacking you personally, it rather accepted as, yeah, we want to do better. And that was the approach. So I don't know quite how you go about it now or whether what other entities are involved. Like they were a big help to us in going about that work. Yeah. Yeah, so we do have connections to Emergency Management Ontario. Uh, a number of uh, staff are actually um, taking some IMS training right now, the Incident Management System, which is a sort of new response framework for how to respond to community emergencies. So they have a number of tools through that process that we can access. Um, we also completed, we were sort of half a bit of a hybrid system uh, throughout the pandemic of using IMS mixed with what's called ECG. Um, again, these are a lot of an acronyms, that sort of thing. But there's essentially a lot of forms that we can review as well, too, um, and other sort of measures. We're also going to be looking at uh, how other uh, First Nations and Indigenous communities have reviewed their own pandemic response, just to see if there's other sort of ideas as well, too. Um, but yeah, completely agree. We want to definitely acknowledge the good work that's been done. And if there were any gaps along the way, we want to use it as a learning opportunity, um, because it was, it was a number of years that that response was in place. Um, which is uh, obviously a big difference with a pandemic as opposed to a, um, a most other type of community emergencies that tend to take place. So I don't know, Deb, if you want to add anything. I completely agree with you, Cynthia, on getting that feedback, not just from our um, community about what we did well and what we needed to improve on, but also from our staff, those that were, were responding. It's important, and that's actually part of the whole process of a pandemic is once it's done, you then stop <clears throat> and review what what you did and, and how well you did. Um, I, I really want to see this happen for our community because this pandemic literally changed the way that we lived. Um, we had to put measures in place for the protection of our community as a whole, but we do recognize that those measures also impacted the way that they lived their ability to be with one another and having to be the voice in public health to sometimes put that message out to the public that you can't gather 
especially when people were losing loved ones, that was devastating for staff as well as the community. So we really want to give people an opportunity to talk openly about how that impacted them. Um, and was there a better way that we could have done that? Um, at the time, that was the way that we had to do it. But, you know, again, it's the first time that we've dealt with a, a pandemic of this magnitude. Uh, but we really want to get that feedback from our community as well. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Melba? Thank you for your presentation and your ongoing work concerning the pandemic. Um, I hear people in a community talk about after effects, and they believe in that they suffer at times from long COVID. They're not sure because their doctors don't say, yes, you are right. You are suffering this or this. And I think the mental state of the people, not only Six Nations, but as a whole, they're very dangerous now. They're driving um, actions, for example. They take more chances. I'm not sure what's going on with them, but I do believe there's a different mental state of a lot of the people as a result of COVID. I wonder about that. And hopefully there's going to be some research done, whole, you know, whole research on that. And the other thing is um, traditional beliefs. And hopefully you're going to cover that. What is that? You know, how did they respond to this? Because we all know that we were very concerned that that ceremonies continued and we were really concerned oh my goodness they're you know they're having a ceremony and they're not you know abiding by staying home as well as maybe some other people so if that could be covered that would be really great thank you i'll just respond sort of initially to that um yeah and it, it's it's a real challenge with the pandemic in general because it, it affects everything it affects all sort of ways of life no one's sort of untouched even if you don't get sick or get sick severely, you're still impacted, obviously, by that social isolation, um, change of experiences. Um, I mean, especially in the early days where we all had to stay at home and the lockdown and everything else like that, it played a lot. Uh, I think of even um, like young ones at the time, the kids in school and everything else, not being able to interact and those development pieces and everything else at the time, like there's there, there's mountains and mountains of research that has already been done, not necessarily in community on COVID, but I know sort of across the country and internationally on COVID and the impacts of it. Uh, it hasn't only been physical, but like you said, it's been mental, it's been social factors and everything else. So um, we're going to, we'll look into as much as we can. I know the COVID-19 community study did cover a lot um, within their study already. Um, our, our primary focus is going to be on the organization and sort of the direct community impacts of the response. Um, but we'll cover uh, as much as we're able to within that space. Um, yeah, I don't know, Deb, if you want anything else to add. Yeah, okay. Okay, with um, Hazel. Yeah, we're just going to make a comment about uh, not only the pandemic that was really stressing the people, it kind of happened at the same time as a uh, uh, find at the residential school. And I think those two things were major for everybody and I don't think there's one person that can say that they weren't affected by residential school uh, findings and the pandemic because, um, you know, lose, losing family members, not being allowed to even go in a funeral home, like those impacts were huge. And I don't think anybody got away with being free from it because it happened to everybody. So that's my comment. Okay, the resolution, uh, Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council approve the work of the COVID-19 Evaluation Committee led by Deb Jonathan and Zach Miller and for their committee to provide a report back at the co conclusion of the work. Is there a mover? Moved by Melba, second by Amos. All in favor? Anybody opposed? See none carried. Wave second reading. Melba, second by Amos. All in favor? Anybody opposed? See none carried. Okay, thank you. Let's go to number six, adoption of the ge general council minutes. Is there a, um, a mover? Is there changes? Elena? Changes 
Um, just the attendance to correct the attendance. Correct the attendance. Okay, moved by Elena, second by Carrie. All in favor? Be opposed? See none. Carried. So let's go to number seven, recommendation from the Justice Committee. Uh, moved by Leslie Green and second by we need a mover because Melba is in the motion. Moved by um, Cynthia that the Justice Committee meeting recommends that to the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council that Dale Bunbury and Melba Thomas act as the council representatives on the Six Nations Police Commission. All in favor? Can be opposed? See none. Carried. Wave second reading. Leslie and second by Cynthia. All in favor? Can be opposed? See none. Carried. Let's go to number eight. Is there any um, council reports? Okay, if not, uh, let's go to number nine. Nathan, that's yours for the solar eclipse. While we're on the topic of the ECG, um, the fire chief, Mike Seth, called an ECG for uh, Friday, uh, last Friday. So I just want to give a quick uh, summary report of what was discussed there. Uh, as you know, um, April 8th, <clears throat> Uh, these um, the solar eclipse that will be occurring in the afternoon. Um, and uh, we've been monitoring a lot of the news reports coming out about the solar eclipse. Um, we're actually uh, with Hamilton, Niagara, and Six Nations being identified as one of the um, uh, premier, I guess, lack of a better term, premier viewing areas for the solar eclipse that's happening later in that afternoon. Uh, and we know some of our, uh, there is an event uh, being uh, hosted by uh, the Six Nations Public Library as well uh, to view that. Um, so there are a number of concerns uh, being brought forward, uh, not, in, not only from a staffing level, but also from a uh, public health level uh, in terms of uh, what to do and what not to do. Um, <laughs> don't look up um, in, in terms of uh, any time that day. Uh, but we did, uh, working with um, uh, Oswegan Public Health, we are putting out, and I think it went out today, uh, just a guide on on um, uh, just what to do in terms of uh, that particular day, the protocol, uh, don't look up, and, and um, there are uh, glasses being provided, uh, not only at the library, but uh, here as well. Uh, so we just wanted to get some guidance out to the community uh, so that, uh, you know, uh, during that day and, and uh, what to do and what not to do and, and have that guide out to the community. In addition to that, we are uh, concerned. So uh, Six Nations Police was on, on the line as well. Um, we are anticipating, given the news releases, that there will be increased traffic coming in. Uh, obviously, we don't want people driving down our roads and just stopping and, and looking up. Um, so we are um, looking at some contingency plans and best plans available uh, to ensure that our roadways are, are left clear during that time uh, and everything's safe. Um, so the summary does provide uh, some of the, um, the action items coming out of that meeting uh, in terms of public works. Uh, they're going to be remain working. Uh, ideally, employees will be kept indoors for that particular day, but they are um, ready um, with um, traffic control should that be required. Social services, the children daycare will be kept indoors during this day. Communication will be provided and guidance given to the parents and guardians. Um, and this directive is also coming from the Ministry of Health. Um, communications, as, you, as I uh, talked about, we are putting out fact sheets as well as frequently asked question documents. And uh, currently, it was slated that Parks and Rex is holding a viewing of the eclipse um, as well with the public library. Um, concerns, the possible influx of people attending Six Nations to view the eclipse. It was stated in, uh, like I said, it was stated in a number of news channels and uh, media outlets that this is a, a concern. Uh, and like I said, we don't want people uh, just stopping on the road uh, without proper safety precautions in place um, going forward. <clears throat> uh, Six Nations Police, they've reached out to OPP um, analytics unit to monitor vehicles and vehicle safety coming onto the territory. Six Nations Police will keep people 
uh, from stopping and keep the flow of traffic moving. Uh, in terms of Six Nations Fire, um, we're bringing the ATV to the headquarters and staffing additional trucks, uh, which will be held at stash Station 5 as, as a standby. Uh, also, I've started a Google alert with Everbyte events, as we know through um, the experience with the Chinese Lantern events a few times. Uh, folks like buying tickets and coming down. Uh, so we are cognizant of that. So I'm monitoring Everbright to see if there is going to be a ticket sale or any type of uh, event coming down to Six Nations. Um, there was questions, uh, just to note that the federal schools will be closing that particular day. Six Nations administration will remain open uh, and that communication is going to go out to staff as well as um, um, uh, that precautionary kind of uh, guide um, to keep them everybody safe. So. Uh, just wanted to give everybody an update. We did have an ECG on Friday, and uh, that's a summary of the discussion that that occurred. Uh, if we do need to, we'll call another ECG uh, just to kind of finalize a lot of those points. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, Kerry? Yeah, all we need now is for April 8th to be a rainy day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Okay, thank you, Nathan. Uh, let's go to number 10. Um, I have no more, no updates from Chief's office. Uh, number 11, there's no scheduling. So number 12, a uh, motion to adjourn to go into the in-camera. Moved by Cynthia, second by Elena. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Seen on carried. Thank you for joining us tonight and have a great night.